Good afternoon. Welcome to session two of the Kaiser Music Series. Today's session is being led by Dr. Benson, um, and it is on flute tone production. Uh, Dr. Benson is hailed by New York Times as powerful and passionate. He joined the faculty at David L. Walters Department of Music in the fall of 2011, where he is Associate Professor of Flute Studies director of orchestral studies and conductor of the JSU Civic Symphony and the Jacksonville Opera Theater Orchestra. And he also teaches music history. In 2019, he was honored by receiving the JSU Faculty Scholar Lecturer of the Year Award for his service to research, publication, and original work in the music field. In 2012, Dr. Benson was awarded the JSU Ray and Ruth Ringer Award for superior achievements and accomplishments in the flute community. He served as a coordinator for the National Flute Association's Young Artist Competition from 2013 to 18 and is currently serving as a board member and the program chairman for the flute, Florida's Flute Association's annual conventions until 2020. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Jeremy Benson. Good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Hayward, thank you for this great opportunity, uh, not only for me, but for everyone watching and, and um, everyone who wants to learn something new today. I'm looking forward to learning from all our participants as well. So the flute can be a real pesky, pesky instrument, but it can also be very beautiful. And we have to have it on the front row of our band, and we need to have it in the middle row of our orchestra. And we want it to sound the absolute best that we can make it. So I'm going to talk about flute tone production today and give you some ideas and some um, things that I use in my own playing, some things I use with my students that I've learned from other teachers, and things that I've come up with on my own that you can try on your own at home for a hands-on demonstration to improve your tone. So before we get started, if you, if you want to follow along and interact with me, go ahead and get a chopstick or a pencil. Chopsticks work great. If you um, have a chopstick you can use, go ahead and get that and have that on hand. So we're going to use it for demonstration in just a moment. One of the most important things about flute tone production is just making sure that the flute is put together properly, making sure that the head joint is in the correct location. So what I do when I pick up my flute, I never touch the keys. I always touch the barrel right here, hold it by the barrel. And I'll put my head joint on right here. And I never touch the lip plate because it's just attached under this metal by what's called a chimney. And it can pop off if we're, if we're really rough on it. So I'll try to never touch any of the keys or any parts of the mechanism. And then I'll put on the foot joint. And I'll hold it down here past the keys and twist that into place. But I'm going to make sure that my tone hole is in line with with my first key and I'll just look down the flute like this when it's in line I'm I'm ready to go so I want to set myself up for success before I even play my first note to make sure that I can roll in and out accordingly as needed to improve my tone and my pitch so um, many people think that when you play the flute you blow across the tone hole which it's almost accurate, but when I play the flute, I like to blow down into the tone hole. The flute is really the closest instrument to the human voice. There's no resistance back from the lip plate. Clarinet players blow into a mouthpiece. Saxophone players blow into a mouthpiece, and they have a reed. Oboe players blow into a double reed, two reeds on top of each other. Brass players blow into a mouthpiece. Every other wind instrument but us has some resistance back except for the flute and that can be very challenging for us because once the air leaves our mouth it just disperses into the universe so we want to make sure that our air gets down into the flute and all the way through the end of the instrument so it takes a lot of air to play the flute okay so first thought not blowing across the tone hole but to blow down into the tone hole so how do we do that? Well, it's all set up from our embouchure. Embouchure, it's a long word. It's a fancy word, but it's all about how we position and place our lips, how we form and shape our lips to play the flute. 
So for me, my embouchure is more down like this, like a frown. The corners of, the, of my lips are down. My cheeks are really relaxed, if you can see. And I'll pull the corners of my lips down like this. I don't pull it back like I'm smiling or say the vowel E. Everybody at home say the vowel E. Feel how your the corners of your lips are back. That's too tight. And then you've got uh, a lot of stretching right here. Down and relaxed like you're saying ooh, ooh. So that's my embouchure for when I play flute. And I bring my lips to the flute and they attach just underneath my bottom lip. So for me, I am putting the lip plate in the crook of my chin, forming my lips down, not back, like I'm smiling. Flute players, we want to be happy people, but with frowns when we play the flute. So we bring our lips down like this. And we make our sound. So let me do a demonstration for you. If I were talking to you and I was going to say um, a sentence, Sally walked to the store, but I said it with my teeth tight, my teeth clenched and together and the corners of my lips back, it would sound like this. Sally went to the store. It would sound really tight, really pinched. If I open up my teeth, drop my jaw and the corners of my lips down, it would sound like, Sally went to the store. Two totally different ways to hear how I say the same sentence. And that's one thing that we need to think about in our flute playing. We want to have our teeth open. We want to have the corners of our mouth down and relaxed and no tightness in our face. Here is that same note. I'm going to play a G. The same note two ways. The first way with my teeth really tight, like Sally goes to the store, teeth tight and my lips pulled back like most flute players play. This is what that note sounds like. The pitch is, is generally sharp for that note. The timbre and the resonance of that note is almost non-existent. It's very tight. It's very shrill. And the, the tone quality is very unfocused. So if I drop my teeth, open my jaw, and the corners of my mouth are down more for that same note, this is what I get. Here they are back to back. So I hope you can hear that difference through the computer on your end because when I play with my teeth more together and the corners of my lips up like I'm smiling or saying the vowel E, the tone is really tight and shrill and the pitch is really sharp. When I drop down and open my teeth and bring the corners of my lips down more like a frown, that's when my tone starts to open up more for me and I can control the pitch much better. And I'm going to show you on your own at home how you can work to improve and know and feel what opening your teeth feels like with the use of a chopstick. But before I go on, let me say one other thing that I was really concentrating on. I was making sure that I was staying rolled out on the tone hole. So that means that my, my hands are going to control rolling in or out. And I want to cover about a third of the lip plate. That's about as much as I want to cover, just about a third. That way, if I need to adjust the pitch by rolling in or out, depending on if it's sharp or flat, I can do that. Or I can control how much air is being pushed down into the flute. So we want to cover about a third of the flute. So now I want to share with you um, a technique that I've learned and a demonstration for you using a chopstick. So it's really easy to to hear me say keep your teeth open, use more of a frown, but when you put your flute up to play 
it's hard to do that because your muscles inside of your mouth have already been trained. They are already remembering muscle memory in your mouth where your teeth are going to close or bite down when you play the flute. So what I like to do in my playing and also with my students is to teach them to not bite down and close their teeth. So what I want to do is help you create muscle memory within your mouth um, that you can always feel when you need to go to a feeling of keeping your teeth open. So we're going to take a chopstick or if you have a pencil that's fine and we're going to put it in our mouth like this and we're going to put it back in behind our teeth and bite down. If you need to swallow the water in your mouth Swallow it along the way, that's perfectly fine. But once you clamp down on this chopstick, it's like alligator teeth. Don't let back up. So I'm going to keep mine at the front of my mouth. I want you to push yours back. I'm going to keep mine up here so I can still talk to you and you can understand me. What we are doing is creating muscle memory inside of our mouths. So in just a moment, when you take your chopstick out, don't do it just yet, I'll let you know when. When you take it out, you're going to have this wild sensation in your mouth because your teeth have stopped at this point. This chopstick is keeping your teeth open. So I had a very thoughtful student one time ask me, said, Dr. Benson, if you want us to keep our teeth open, why are you telling us to bite down? And I thought, well, you know, that's a very thoughtful um, question and observation. I am asking you to bite it down, but your teeth are going to stop at the width of your chopstick or your pencil. So what's going to happen when I put this in, there's, there's going to be an automatic space between my teeth and my muscles are going to start to memorize where this space is within my mouth. So after really about two minutes of having this chopstick in your mouth biting down, and then you take it out, this is where my teeth want to stop, right, right there, and I can feel that. So if you've had your chopstick in your mouth during this time, go ahead and take it out and see what it feels like, and hopefully you, you can understand what I'm talking about. Your teeth want to go to this position where the chopstick was in your mouth and stop. Keep your teeth open just like that when you go to play your flute. So that way you got this space between your teeth when you go to play. I even take it one step further. I play with the chopstick in my mouth. I'll, I'll leave it in like this and then play. And if you're trying that at home, there's a very good possibility you're not getting a sound out. You're not even making a tone. And you're saying, how in the world is he able to get a tone out? I can't get a sound out with this chopstick in my mouth. It's because I'm aiming my ear down into the tone hole. So you'll be able to tell what you've been doing up to this point in your playing if you've been aiming your ear more across the tone hole or if you've been aiming your ear down and if you can try to retrain yourself to blow down more into the tone hole you'll be able to play with the chopstick in your mouth so now what i want you to do is play like an f major scale two octaves slurred or if you can just play one octave that's just fine f major scale two octaves slurred and the only thing that you're really focusing on right now is just making sure that your teeth are staying open, you're dropping your jaw, and you got that same feeling of that chopstick in your mouth. Without the chopstick in my mouth, or if my teeth are tight, my F major scale sounds like this. Sounds like F major to me, but it sounds very unfocused in tone. Um, the pitch is not consistent. Um, and there's no resonance in the sound. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. But if I think about the chopstick in my mouth, my teeth are open, my jaw is dropped, the corners of my mouth are down, and my air is being aimed down into the tone hole, this is what I get. 
You can hear the difference in how my sound is able to open up more when I'm opening up the teeth. I mentioned a word a moment ago, resonance. If you walk into um, somewhere like a, a gymnasium or maybe even a bathroom somewhere where there's a, a solid floor and maybe not a lot of furniture and a lot of open spaces, you can hear like an echo. If you were to clap your hand, you hear an echo, 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 echo. That's, that's what I mean by resonance. We want to hear more of that overtone, more of that outer sound within our, within our tone. It's very tight, very unfocused, it's very clenched, and my teeth are close together. I don't hear a lot of resonance in that, in that sound. It doesn't make me happy. So, I'm listening for more than just an F. I'm going to open my teeth, drop my jaw, and keep my cooter open, and form my embouchure down. I can hear more resonance and what we call overtones in that, and that makes me much happier as a flute player. Another thing that I like to do to improve my tone is work on harmonics. And we don't really play a lot of these on the flute because we have a fingering for every note. Brass players, they have a lot of harmonics. They can play, um, they can use the same fingering to produce different pitches. But we can, on flute, also use harmonics. And what that, what that means is we can play a note and aim our air up and overblow it to produce a different note. Like if I were playing a G, and I aim my air up for the second octave, and I aim my air up just a little bit more, push my bottom lip forward, aim the air up, I can get a different tone that's not a G. That would be a D above the staff. So that's harmonics. When we use fingerings and overblow and blow higher, blow the air up to, to get a different tone. And I like to put those into an exercise where I start, for me, I start on the low C, the lowest C, the first ledger line below the staff, and I'll slur up to G and back down three times. You go whatever speed you like. I like a faster tempo for this, but go whatever speed is comfortable for you, and it would sound like this. You're going to do it three times. Then you're going to use the exact same fingering, that low C fingering, C, D, E. Put your pinky down for the E, F, G, F, E, D, C. You're going to use that same fingering, but overblow at one octave. So to overblow one octave, you're going to push your bottom lip forward a little bit to angle the air upwards a little bit more. Same fingering up an octave. Then for the third time, you're going to do the exact same exercise. You're going to overblow at one harmonic using the low C up to G fingering. Okay, and then for the fourth and final one, you're going to overblow it two octaves, the same fingering. So this is a really great way to start to train your lip, lips to be flexible in amateur. Um, these are overblowing the harmonics, but I like to take this exercise just one step further. Um, pianissimo. I like to play it quietly because once you start getting into the upper octave, the higher octave, and the angle of your ear is not upwards to play into the top octave, or if your support from your tummy, from your tummy ear, if you're not having good support, your notes are going to crack and it'll sound like this. See how it cracked?
And in order out of that soft volume to get those higher notes to speak, I've got to make sure that my air is fast. I am using good support for my tummy. My bottom lip is pushed forward to get up into that top octave. And that everything is all in line. And if it's not, it will crack. And that's how you know you're not using good support. Maybe you've been in band class or orchestra and your director says, need more support, more air support, more breath control, more air support. What, what do you think your band director is asking you to do? I heard somebody say, they say, use more air. No. Any other guesses? Play louder? No. They don't want you to play louder. I've heard it all. I want to do exercise with you. Put your hand on your tummy right now and lean forward like you're doing an ab crunch, a sit up, until you feel that tightness in your tummy. I'm not going to lean on over, you'll see my bald spot on top of my head. But, but uh, put your hand on your tummy till you feel that tightness down there, like an ab crunch, and then lean back up and keep that tightness in your tummy. That's what I want my students to do when I ask them to support. I want them to feel that tightness like they were doing a sit-up in their tummy. And if you have that tightness, if you have that support, and you have fast air like you're blowing out a birthday candle, fast air, or you're trying to blow a bowling ball across the table, fast and steady air, you push your bottom lip forward to angle the air up, you'll have no problems to get out those top notes. Angling up. Okay? Now, you can try that on D flat if you like. My favorite is D minor. I like to, to do that same exercise on D, E, F, G, A. I'm going to get quieter the higher I go. The other thing that I also want to remember in doing this is I want to stay rolled out. Remember, just covering a third of the tone hole. And it's really easy. The higher we go or the softer we get that we want to roll in. We want to bend this wrist forward. But I want to stay on top of those flute keys. Like I'm holding on to a branch and I pull it down like this. I don't want to bend or roll my flute in. When I do this, it rolls the flute in towards my lip, and I'm covering too much of the tone hole. And if that happens, you're not going to be able to get those top notes out easily. It's not going to happen. So we're staying rolled out, okay? And that's how we're going to use our harmonic exercises. So, so far, I've given you a few hands-on tools that you can use on your own, in your own practicing, to get immediate um, maybe not immediate results, but immediate response if you are, are doing these exercises correctly. With the chopstick, we're going to make sure we have space between our teeth, and the chopstick is going to really um, define for us how far to keep our teeth open. Okay, um, the chopstick, if you play with it in your mouth, can also help you to blow the air down, angled more down into the flute and not so much across. And we talked about bringing the corners of the lips down like we're frowning, like we're saying, ooh, not e, but ooh. And then we talked about using harmonics, and, and I gave you a harmonic exercise, starting on a low C up and down to G slurred four times, overblowing a harmonic series each time to check in with our support, check in with the speed of the air, to check in with the angle of the air, and I'm going to mention something about that in just a moment, check in with the angle of the air and to make sure we're not covering too much of the tone hole. And I think once you start to get the good results from those exercises that you want, you're going to start to see 
a big development in your tone production. I, I mentioned a few times and I wanted to make sure that I, I explained it, the angling of the air. So if you were to take a low F, and you know the fingering for that is the thumb, one, two, three, four, the, the, or one, this, the F key and your pinky, that's the fingering for low F. It's also the fingering for middle F. So if I were to ask, you know, students, how do you play that middle F? It's the same fingering as the low F, but how do you get up there? I suspect that some of them would say blow more. No, they would say blow harder. No, um, you have to push your bottom loop forward. I'm going to move my computer around to the side so you can, or maybe I'll just move. So you can see, and I want you to watch my bottom lip, how it moves. Okay, so whenever I want to jump octaves, it's... It's not, or even playing the higher octave, even if I'm not just slurring octaves, I've got to make sure that my air is pushed up, is angled up, and I do that with the bottom lip. So you could see in the demonstration that I just gave you. It's a very fast, the fastest motion that you can possibly get. Because if, if you just sneak into that, or you just make it a slow transition, you're going to get caught in between the octaves. The air is looking for somewhere to go. So you've got to have bottom lip that's moving very fast. So you have to start with the lip down. And that's, that's exactly what I've been explaining to you today is keeping the bottom jaw dropped, keeping the bottom lip down. That way you have more flexibility in your amateur to work around all octaves of the flute. Um, those are the biggest things that I wanted to focus on with you today. There are many other exercises out there dealing with um, long tones and chromatic work, um, and those are very helpful and useful too, and I could do just a whole other masterclass just on using long tones. Um, but, but you can take some of those exercises and incorporate them into some of the demonstration that I've given you today. And you can really develop a tone production program and routine, a system that works specifically for you. But today I wanted to give you just two really immediate response ideas that you can use in your practicing that hopefully you'll get the results that you want. And I know if you'll keep working at this, you're going to be great. Well, thank you for attending our session today. Uh, please like and share and invite your friends out because um, we're going to have Kaiser Music sessions through July. And we're adding ones weekly. So make sure you stay up to date and check the Kaiser Band website at kaiserband.com slash KMS. See you next time.